Jim. There you are. <laughs> I can see. The lights up here, I gotta warn you, the lights up here are pretty bright, makes it hard to see. Uh, Jim Lockhead was appointed Denver, Denver Waters CEO manager in 2010, so he's been doing the job for about 12 years now. Uh, he leads about 1,100 employees, um, and their focus is to provide reliable water supply to the city of Denver and surrounding suburbs. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge system, 4,000 square miles of watershed, 20, res 20 reservoirs, wow and four treatment plants, more 3,000 miles of pipe. He received the 2014 uh, Aspinall Water Leader of the Year Award, so we have two of them sitting in the room right now, I think. And in 2015, he received a Presence Award from the Colorado Foundation for Water Education. With that, Jim, you're gonna come up and wrap it up and just, you know, like, sum it up and give us our marching orders. Thanks, John. Um, thanks, no pressure, Brad. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Um, Sunshine should have been in Santa Fe with us, I think. Like we could have used her, I think. Um, so one of the great joys about being the last speaker of the day is that I know you're looking to peel yourselves out of these very comfortable chairs you've been sitting in all day. And also, as uh, I'm involved with my executive team, and we start going around and around the same thing. We have this saying, everything's been said, but not everybody said everything. Um, so I will try and not say everything that everybody's already said. But I would like to reflect on really where we are under the Colorado River Compact and the situation on the Colorado River today um, and where at least I see us um, headed um, in the future. And I speak not only as the uh, CEO of Denver Water, um, but as someone who has represented Colorado on interstate Colorado River issues um, really since the early 1990s. Um, I was involved in 10 years of negotiations that led up to the 2001 surplus guidelines that were signed by the Secretary of the Interior. I was involved in the 2007 guidelines that were um, uh, dictated the operation of the reservoirs in times of shortage, um, involved in interstate negotiations with Mexico on the Yuma desalting plant and several other aspects of the river. So I bring all that baggage, I guess, with me um, when I talk to you about where we are on the river. Um, and I think was was one of the lessons that we've learned and, and one of the things that was discussed earlier today is that the Colorado River Compact made a, an allocation in perpetuity. And certainly one of the things we've learned is never make an allocation in perpetuity because it will come back to bite you uh, as well it, as it has. Eric raised the, uh, the prospect of really the relevance of the Colorado River Compact. Um, and he, you know, he said, you know, it is what we agree it is. Um, and we can have a lot of arguments over the compact, what it means, what it portends, will it be enforced. Um, but I think that the, the fact is that there are a myriad of different interpretations and interpretations of the compact. And at the end of the day, to be honest with you, it's not really going to matter uh, what that compact says, I believe. Um, there are disagreements over tributaries and tributary use in the lower basin. Um, there are disagreements about whether the upper basin has an obligation to deliver half of any um, shortage to Mexico. Um, there are disagreements about system loss accounting. It's been alluded to that uh, system losses in the lower basin, and I'll talk about this, which total about 1.2 million acre feet a year, aren't allocated uh, to the water users, but instead are absorbed by the system. Um, there are questions about um, Native American entitlements under the compact. Um, and there's been a lot of discussion today about whether, there's, whether or not there's a delivery obligation uh, of the uh, upper basin or a non-depletion obligation. Um, uh, and I'll just say, from a, from a lawyer's perspective, and when I look at, and I'll give the argument, part of the argument here, um, part of what the Supreme Court looks at when it interprets, uh, when it interprets uh, interstate compacts, just like it would interpret any contract, are the actual words of the document. So um, 
Lane Leoniak talked about a, a, the, the, saying that the upper basin shall not deplete the flow below 75 million acre feet. Um, there's been uh, interpretation, or a, that's been interpreted or um, spoken of as being a delivery obligation, but the actual words of the compact are that the upper basin states shall not cause the flow of the river to fall below 75 million acre feet over a 10 year running average. And it's that word cause, which is I think the key word there. Uh, the upper basin, I believe, has a very viable argument that it is not the cause of the problem. We're using four and a half million acre feet on average out of a seven and a half million acre foot entitlement. Um, we, climate change has been alluded to. Um, but basically, we have a causation problem where overuse in the lower basin and the failure of the federal government to proactively address the looming problem that we've seen coming over the last 20 years and the failure, that failure to protect the interests of the upper basin by keeping water in storage to allow the upper basin to meet whatever obligation it might have under the compact um, is the real cause of the problem. We know the system has been overbuilt. Uh, when the Central Arizona project was built, uh, when it was up for authorization in Congress, uh, there was testimony in Congress that uh, both the upper basin and the lower basin and Arizona knew that the Central Arizona project could not sustainably divert its full um, capacity uh, in perpetuity. Again, this in perpetuity, that the CAP would have to take shortages. So there's plenty of fruit for a good solid 10 to 15 years of litigation in front of the United States Supreme Court um, over these questions. Uh, and again, at the end of the day, as alluded to by Eric, um, I don't think the compact really enters into the equation in terms of the issues that we have to deal with um, today. What we have is a very simple mass balance problem. Um, in 1922, the negotiators of the compact figured there was about 20 million acre feet of water in the river. By uh, the year 2000, the average flow during the historical period of record was about 15 million acre feet. During the period from 2000 to the present, the total flow has been just over 12 million acre feet. And if you look at the last few years, it's been under 12 million acre feet. It's more like 11 million acre feet. And you look at total uses in the basin. Um, the upper basin, four and a half million acre feet on average, um, three and a half million acre feet last year um, during a, a very dry year. The lower basin using seven and a half million acre feet, Mexico using a million and a half acre feet, 1.2 million acre feet of system losses in the lower basin. We've got total uses of 15 million acre feet and a historical flow over the last 20 years of 12 million acre feet. No wonder Lakes Powell and Mead are in the condition that they're in today. Um, the bank account has been drawn down and we're looking at uh, a zero balance with no line of credit. Um, so if you look at that strict interpretation of the law of the river and the law of the river is that whole conglomeration of the treaty, the compact, the upper basin compact, a couple of acts of Congress, the United States Supreme Court decree, but it establishes a fairly complex priority system on the river um, in, in very, very simple terms. Mexico gets the first million and a half acre feet. You have irrigation districts in Southern California, the Imperial Irrigation District, Palo Verde, others that are entitled to first priority within California and a cascading system of, of senior to junior within California. You have a priority of California uh, as being senior to the Central Arizona Project and Nevada, and so CAP and Nevada taking shortages before California has to take any shortages. And so if you, if you go down the line and you take the interpretation kind of most favorable to the seniors and most favorable to the lower basin. And um, you look at kind of who takes the hit um, to bring this system into balance if that were all to be litigated out. Um, what you would have would be a situation where upper basin junior users, uh, junior to the compact would be curtailed. 
So you're looking at half of Denver water supply, half of northern supply, the southeastern water Con conservancy district that supplies southeastern Colorado, western slope municipalities, ski areas, curtailed, shut off, done. Um, I would argue that given what we saw last year in terms of water use, um, the prior appropriation system is going to probably take care of that along with hydrology, and it's not going to produce very much water at Lee Ferry. Maybe a half million acre feet to a million acre feet, I'll just estimate. If you assume that Mexico takes a bit of a shortage under the provision of the treaty with Mexico that says that uh, Mexico will share shortages in the event of extraordinary drought, which is not defined in the treaty, um, you're looking at a shortage to Mexico, and remember that Tijuana uh, is a junior user in Mexico and receives the bulk of its water supply from the Colorado River as well. Um, so you're looking at that. Um, Nevada takes a shortage. That's Las Vegas. That's the city of Las Vegas. And then, of course, CAP gets shut off. So Phoenix, Tucson, municipalities in central Arizona are shut off. Um, are we going to be evacuating cities all over the West in order to honor the priority of senior irrigation districts, primarily in California and along the main stem of the Colorado River? Um, I don't think that's going to happen uh, as, a, as a practical matter um, of, you know, despite the, uh, uh, the arguments and the debates that we can have over the meaning of the law of the river. Um, and moreover, we don't have time for litigation or to hash those issues out. Uh, the urgency is now. The crisis is now. Um, literally, within the next two to three years, Lakes Mead and Powell, which are now sitting at about 25%, could hit Deadpool. So what are the practical solutions? What, what do at least I, for one, as one person, see as uh, what might happen in the next two to three years? Because we're literally uh, in a situation of triage. Something needs to be done in the very near term to, say, to lay a foundation for actions that can be taken in the medium and longer term to manage this river to a sustainable condition. So I, three, I see um, three alternatives and, and perhaps a combination of those three alternatives going forward. The first is that um, there, is, there are involuntary uh, regulations and restrictions on water use to bring the system into balance. It's important to understand the authority of the Department of the Interior and the federal government in the lower basin. Every drop of water that enters into Mead has been characterized by the United States Supreme Court as being federal water. That water is allocated in the lower basin by the United States by contract to all the water users in the lower basin. That gives the United States government enormous authority about over what happens in the lower basin. And I would argue that the United States has the ability to account for system losses in the lower basin, which currently aren't being accounted for now, to enforce beneficial use in the districts within the, the lower basin, both agricultural and municipal, and has the right to impose um, shortages in the lower basin to protect uh, human health, the environment, and the infrastructure of the system. In fact, the United States has already exercised that authority in the past. In 1964, 65, uh, when Glen Canyon Dam was filling and uh, there was uh, a shortage on the river, the United States imposed a, a uniform 10 percent reduction on water uses in the lower basin, um, an authority which was upheld by a federal district court in Washington, D.C. It's also important to recognize that the federal government doesn't have that same kind of authority in the upper basin. The United States has various authorities with respect to reclamation projects in the upper basin, arguably could impose uh, restrictions depending on what those might be. But again, as with upper basin curtailment, I would argue it's not going to produce very much water. Uh, if you look at the scope of the problem, the, the time frames involved, um, the political ramifications of reclamation coming into the upper basin, um, I don't think that's a, a real uh, and serious threat, although it's something that I think Colorado 
and other upper basin states um, should be, be aware of. So we've got the issue of, of restrictions that are mandatory that are imposed by the federal government. We also have the possibility, um, although after Santa Fe I would argue um, it's a remote possibility in the next few months anyway, of voluntary agreements among the basin states and water users in the basin to agree on how we're going to manage demands in the system to bring the system back into balance. And remember that uh, the Commissioner of Reclamation this summer asked the basin states to, by August, come up with an agreement to reduce demands by two to four million acre feet. That's a, just a ton of water. Um, and what you have in the basin is a dynamic of finger pointing, of primarily Arizona and, Fal and California staring across the river at each other, uh, seeing who's going to blink first. Um, but that having been said, uh, we do have $4 billion plus uh, that the federal government has available to grease the skids um, in terms of voluntary agreements. So the, there could be a deal within the lower basin for Arizona to put water uh, on the table, um, for California to put water on the table, and that would involve um, a big chunk of water from the Imperial Irrigation District, which would also require a solution to the kind of pervasive problem in the Salton Sea. Um, water use conservation and transfers in the Imperial Valley, climate change have caused the Salton Sea to become a significant health hazard to the people of the um, Imperial Valley, as well as an environmental, a looming environmental disaster. And there needs to be a solution to that problem that is out there with potential for lithium development um, and geothermal uh, and other measures. There's gonna have to be buy-down of uh, demands in the lower basin, um, maybe temporary if that's a bridge to more efficiency and reductions in water use, but certainly there's gonna have to be permanent um, buy-downs in demand um, that can lead to some of the solutions that have been alluded to earlier, um, like crop switching or greater efficiency or those kinds of things. The other aspect of the situation that I think is key to our voluntary agreements is that we currently have uh, a situation where uh, various areas in the basin um, are pitted against each other, whether it's the east slope of Colorado against the west slope of Colorado or the upper basin against the lower basin or whether it's the agricultural sector against the municipal sector. Um, there clearly needs to be participation by upper basin, by lower basin, by municipal, and by agriculture, regardless of the magnitude of the contribution to the problem, uh, because collectively those contributions can and will add up to create more sustainability in the system. Um, in talking about this issue with some of my colleagues in other municipal utilities, um, we've discussed the role of municipal, municipal utilities in the system. And municipalities get, uh, are, are kind of an easy target. You'll have people in agriculture saying we're an easy target, but um, there's, a, I think, a, somewhat of a perception that if, you, if, municipal, if municipalities would only conserve more, um, that we'd, we'd solve the problem. You can literally evacuate all the cities that are dependent on Colorado River water, and it's not going to solve the problem. Um, we've got a bigger problem than that. That having been said, municipalities um, can step to the table. And so in talking to my peers, um, you may have read that Denver Water, along with Pueblo, Colorado Springs, Aurora, Southern Nevada Water Authority, Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, and I think you'll see around November 1st, around 20 more cities joining in a memorandum of understanding, recognizing the role of municipal utilities in solving this problem. The memorandum um, does a couple of things. First of all, it recognizes the efforts that we've made to date uh, in terms of reducing demands uh, for water and increasing the efficiency of municipal use. In Denver water service area, for example, uh, we're using about 36% less water than we did in the year 2000, despite having about 600,000 more people within our service area. We're using about as much water as we did in the 1970s. So we all recognize that we've done a lot, but we also recognize that we need to do a lot more. 
And so the MOU commits us to do three things. First of all, to double down on our efforts on conservation and efficiency. Uh, we all have um, aggressive conservation programs, but we can and we should do better. Secondly, it commits us to um, doubling down on our reuse and recycling programs. Um, fairly, relatively, let me put it that way, straightforward for a municipality that's on the coast. It's expensive, you've got environmental issues, um, it's, it's not easy. It's really hard if you're on the front range of Colorado because there's not an ocean there to take the brine stream. It's also very difficult because the only water that can be reused on the Colorado Front Range is either imported water or water that's taken away from agriculture, consumptive use that's taken away from agriculture. And I would note as kind of a footnote that Denver Water uh, has not relied on agricultural supplies uh, for our water supply. Um, and we are not supportive of buy and dry programs um, if we ever even wanted to think about it. So, um, but, the, but the challenge, f therefore, for, for reuse in the Front Range, in addition to dealing with the brine stream, is it depends on the continued reliability and sustainability of Colorado River water. So as long as there's a cloud uh, over Colorado River water by this depletion obligation, non-depletion obligation um, under the compact until we solve that problem, um, it makes it hard to make a, a, a big investment in reuse and recycling. But nonetheless, uh, Denver Water does have a recycle plant. We deliver recycled water for uh, parks and other green ir uh, irrigation within our service area. And then the third piece of the MOU um, is that we've all committed to a 30% reduction in non-functional turf. Um, non-functional turf, uh, the simplest definition of that is turf which only sees a lawnmower. And I, there's a big expanse of grass right out there. Um, but if, if it's turf that you don't see people on, except for a lawnmower, it's non-functional and probably needs to go away. Um, Southern Nevada has really led the charge on that. You may have read about the city of Aurora adopting a very um, aggressive ordinance on the issue of turf. Um, and and as, I, as I talk about this goal, it's, it's easy to say it's kind of, it's, it's quite difficult to implement. Um, first of all, I think uh, Brad Udall uh, alluded to the fact that maintaining the urban tree canopy is critical uh, to the environmental uh, health of cities. And you can't pull out growth, uh, grass and kill trees at the same time. We also need to be mindful of underserved communities, many of which don't have functional turf, much less non-functional turf. And we need actually more greening in a lot of these underserved communities. Um, Secondly, or another complication is it's, it's really expensive. Just pulling the turf out is ex expensive, but it needs to be replaced with native landscaping that's attractive, that can demonstrate uh, the viability of very attractive native landscaping, not astroturf, which is not sustainable because you're just replacing it with plastic that's gonna have to be reused and recycled back into PFAS and, and forever chemicals. So um, it's gotta be native vegetation, it's gotta be attractive. Um, and it's got to be maintained. Um, so it's a program that um, we are committed at, at Denver Water and these other utilities are committed to um, uh, implementing uh, both in the short term and the long term, but it's not going to produce water tomorrow on the river as that's needed. And then I would finally also note with regard to the issue of grass and turf, that it doesn't make sense for us to be spending a lot of money and going through a lot of programs removing existing turf if developers can just come back in and plant bluegrass again. We need um, strong, I think, regulatory programs um, toward native landscaping for new developments in Colorado and particularly in the Front Range of Colorado. And, and um, if, it, if it can't be through local jurisdictions, I know that Colorado is very much of a local control state, but perhaps some state legislation around this topic might be in order. So those are the two alternatives. We can have um, uh, mandatory restrictions, we can have voluntary agreements, um, or we could go down the course that we're going right now, which is um, kind of the tragedy of the commons approach, in which case nothing happens. Um, we have litigation um, and 
Powell and Mead go to Deadpool and we have run of the river. So what does that mean? It means um, if Reclamation literally can't get water past Glen Canyon Dam, which they're concerned about, imagine no water in the Grand Canyon. Um, if you're in the lower basin, the, the senior water users in the agricultural districts in particular um, are playing a little bit of a game of chicken because um, they can't use their priority if there's no water. And if Lake Mead is running run of the river and it's running only, say, six million acre feet, million, million and a half, million and a half has to go to Mexico, you have 1.2 million in system losses, there's not a heck of a lot of water left even for those senior, senior users. Um, I think that there's a beginning of an understanding um, about that in the lower basin, but not enough to motivate um, those users to come to the table. Um, and so I think that we began to see last week um, the outlines of a possible federal response and what, what, we, what, we, what has driven every success so far on the river, whether it was the 2001 um, surplus guidelines, whether it was the 2007 um, uh, shortage guidelines, was a federal threat that if the states didn't come together and agree, the federal government was gonna do something. And the federal government hasn't made that threat credibly yet. Uh, we began to see the glimmer of that last week in Santa Fe. Perhaps after the elections, we might see a little bit stronger federal response. Um, but I believe what we need is a credible uh, uh, understanding from the federal government that if there's not agreement by a date certain that things are gonna happen, that there are gonna be these um, mandatory restrictions that will occur, um, and that hopefully will drive the voluntary um, agreements that we need as a whole basin to make sure that we, to we maintain this, this system. So I don't know where that leaves me in time, but um, that's probably enough for you all. And with that, I will, I will end. Jim, are you okay with taking questions? This is Jennifer. Oh, Rather. hey. Yep, uh, sure. Are there any questions for Jim? He did a great job of outlining what's going on on the river and his take on it. And you can shake your head. I have a question that is kind of goes down to PFAS you mentioned. Is there data um, from the 200,000 acres that burned, we lost the tree canopy, you know, all the debris that came downstream. Is there a money lost, acre feet lost, and time that we've been set back? Is there a formula that, that we know kind of in insurance, it's called acts of God, you know, <laughs> that kind of affect that total going forward with climate change that we know we're gonna have more forest fires coming, what can we learn from what we went through? Or do we know yet? Um, Brad probably should answer that question. Um, and I'll let you do that if you want. But I, um, we, we have got to just think completely differently than we have in the past. Um, we, we have, uh, Historically, water planning, water development has been a, a completely linear process where uh, we've taken the past hydrology, we've taken a uh, past population growth, uh, project that out on a line, look at the gap and say, well, we just need to go out and get more water and assume that there's gonna be more, more water to get and things aren't gonna, gonna change. And um, what we know now is that we don't know a whole lot. And, um, we undertake at Denver Water a, a process that we call scenario planning, which is based on a future of complete uncertainty and the need to prepare for any potential scenario going forward. Um, in order to be, to even begin to meet the, the challenges of climate change, I think that we need a whole new way of thinking of dealing with all of those extremes um, that we've talked about today. There's another question, oh, oh Brad. Go hey, Jim, you might mention <clears throat> Buffalo Creek and Heyman and how you yeah. all have responded to those fires because there are real lessons there. Um, Denver Water, I think, 
pretty much had our heads in the sand uh, until the Buffalo Creek and Hayman fires, um, which occurred uh, at the time were the worst fires in Colorado's history, uh, occurred in critical watersheds above key reservoirs in our system um, that supply 80% of the water supply to our service area and created um, massive amounts of sediment into these reservoirs, significant water quality problems, um, and really caused a fundamental shift in the way that, that we have um, approached water supply planning. Uh, and again, not the linear approach, um, but more of a proactive approach of recognizing uh, watersheds and forests as just as much a part of our system as the gray infrastructure that we build. Um, so in the wake of um, Buffalo Creek and Hayman, uh, we began a program called, called from, for, from Forest to Faucets, where we matched with the United States Forest Service, dollar for dollar, investments in forest treatment, um, not to thin the forest um, for the purpose of creating water supply, but to create um, a more natural uh, forest that has better wildlife habitat that can withstand periodic fires and not have it become the kind of catastrophic fires that we see today. We also um, began partnerships in watershed health um, throughout all the watersheds that supply our, uh, our system. Um, we reached an agreement with Western Colorado called the Colorado River Cooperative Agreement um, by which we gained support for the enlargement of Gross Dam, which began um, construction this year. Um, we weren't obligated to uh, make some of the investments that uh, we were obligated to make in Grand and Summit counties for environmental health under that agreement, but we knew that we needed to, to go forward anyway. So we have undertaken a lot of, of programs in uh, Grand and Summit counties toward environmental health. Um, DK mentioned the problem of temperature and flow in the, in the upper Colorado River Basin this last year. Um, Denver water... Uh, uh, voluntarily did not divert water that we were entitled to in order to allow it to um, stay in the river for temperature control purposes and we've made um, water available uh, as needed in the late summer. Uh, things have gotten a little bit better this in the late summer. Um, so we recognize that the health of the aquatic and uh, systems and the watersheds that supply our system um, are maybe more important than the great infrastructure that we have, to be honest with you, if we're going to meet our mission to our customers uh, 50 and 100 years from now. One more question. Yes, first, thank you to you and everybody else. And I appreciate very much as a hydrologist, you're defining it as a mass balance question. I always work in the headwaters, so all this downstream and big picture stuff is a little outside my expertise. But um, you, if I do, the numbers correctly, um, we're still talking nine to 10 million now acre feet. And Bureau of Reclamation, if they put the you know, complete stop or something like that, is going to be several million acre feet. Um, and I just don't see how we can get, you know, I think that we may be in a moving target if we're having more and more verification going on and you know, increasing ET and all the rest of it as temperatures go up. So, you know, are, I'm not sure that even with the things you're talking about that we can get there because we're still going to be in the same point, basically, kind of a triage situation, whether it's five years down the road or 10 years down the road or 15 years down the road, even if we, quote, fix it now. So how bad is my math and where do you see the future? <laughs> so nice, easy question. I'm sorry to say I don't think your math is wrong. Um, I... Uh, you know, we are talking about a short-term urgent situation that's needed today, much less dealing with that future of significantly less water in the system, much less trying to bring these reservoirs back to a condition where they can serve their original function, which is to balance out the erratic flows in the river. Um, when, I, when I talked about Lake Mead operating at run of the river, uh, it's important to remember that this river flows really low in some years um, and really high in some years. Um, and so 
if, if we're in a run of the river situation and dealing with the natural variability of this river and having the average flow being significantly less than it's been historically, that's a real serious problem. And I agree with you. We're going to be dealing with this for years and years to come. Um, Four billion from the federal government is a nice small down payment on that problem, but it won't even begin to touch the long-term issues that we face going forward. So let's thank Stu. So on that note. <laughs> <laughs> We've got Dr. John Tracy who's going to give some closing remarks. Thank you, Jim. Thanks. So uh, after all the talks today, I want to thank all of our speakers, our moderators, our panelists, uh, the sponsors for the event, the planning committee, uh, for pulling all of this together, which is no easy feat. So thank you all and give yourself a hand. And, and just wrapping it up, a couple things, uh, sort of teeing off some of the things Jim said. Uh, the first one is, is that, you know, the current situation in the last two or three years has really brought forward the two decades where the flow has been less. And the discussion seems to have started over a decade ago of like, what are we going to do if we got the numbers wrong and had a drought, drought contingency plans? So it's the old administrative maxim, never let a good crisis go to waste. And so they're finally at the point of a good crisis. And I, I think there's one other thing uh, Jim brought up of talking about changing how we think about what we perceive as solving the problem, you know, and moving away from the linear thinking. I'm an engineer, so we're great linear thinkers. You have a problem, you understand the whole problem, and you solve the problem, you're done, move on to the next problem. Well, what I've kind of noticed in watersheds, watershed management, is that's never the way it works. And the linear thinking just leads you to more and more problems and you know, bigger and bigger problems. So I think some of this is, is thinking about maybe changing the dialogue we use a little. Because I think the situation in the Colorado has gotten to the point that there, there really is no problem to be solved. It's a situation to be managed. And the situation is constantly changing. And thinking about the difference between solving a problem and managing a situation. When you manage a situation, you take the little wins that come with it. It's just like, oh, ooh, we got through this one. We came up with maybe this really small thing that doesn't seem big and large. But it helps you get through that. It helps you manage it. And then you can move on to the next one and move on to the next one. And it doesn't really get to the heart of coming up with the grand solution that I think gets discussed quite a bit in the Colorado River, as well as uh, many other river systems I've seen. But it does hopefully lead to something where you can start seeing positive incremental changes in the long run. And whether this comes down to coming to an agreement to buy some water uh, allocations in the lower basin, or it talks about cities reducing, if I got the numbers right, their water use 30 some percent in, in uh, <laughs> oh, get rid of the turf. But, but those are the things where you begin to realize, yes, that isn't the grand solution. We heard it every time. The cities alone, you can't put it on their back. It won't matter. You can't, you can't solve the problem with the interbasin transfers. You can't solve the problem with just simple increases in uh, ag irrigation efficiency. But if you look at this as not trying to come up with the solution to the problem all at once, but just little management situations that incrementally get there, we might be in a situation where we'll still be talking about climate change. We'll be still talking about we'd love to have more water on the Colorado River but it might lead to a situation where there's these, these little winds can start rolling on themselves and lead to something where it's a, a little less contentious of a con, uh, con, conversation as we move forward. And so with that note, we do have a couple of events coming up. One is Water in the West, November 2nd and 3rd down, at the, uh, down in Denver. Uh, there'll be an element of it where we actually get to the Spur campus there, although the whole event will not be at the Spur campus. And that will focus a lot on uh, larger global water issues and some of the discussion on the, uh, the, the, the Columbia River Treaty and the Colorado River Treaty uh, are going to be uh, some of the panel discussions there. And even before that, the Salazar Center, which is part of the Office of Engagement and Extension, is having their borderlands discussion and conservation, of which a significant part is talking about managing water resources across the U.S. and Mexico border. That's October 6th and 7th down in Denver. Uh, near Union Station. So I'd encourage you to look at those and if you're interested uh, participating and seeing additional perspectives on how we manage water resources across I guess I'd say political jurisdictions and uh, just continue in the conversation and hopefully 
maybe come up with ideas that can help manage the situation and which can lead to maybe longer term solutions to the issues at hand. And with that, I'd like to thank everybody and uh, hope you have a good rest of the day. Bye.